Queens of Europe. Marie Antoinette, Part Two. With her reputation in tatters after years of excessive spending on her luxurious lifestyle and the disaster of the affair of the diamond necklace, Marie Antoinette, Queen of France, was in serious trouble. In an attempt to get a handle on the situation, the queen involved herself more in politics. She and the king made much-needed cutbacks to the royal expenditure. They had no choice but to call an assembly of notables to make desperately needed financial reforms. But the parlement refused to cooperate, and the plan fell through. France's financial woes were the result of a combination of factors: several expensive wars, a large royal family that cost the state a great deal, and an unwillingness on the part of the aristocracy and clergy to relinquish any of their financial privileges. The queen was not solely to blame, but she became a symbol of financial injustice and was given the nickname Madame Deficit. It was claimed that when she heard the French peasants had run out of bread, she responded, "Let them eat cake," though she never actually said this. In 1785, Marie gave birth to her second son, Louis Charles. The fact that he was born exactly nine months after the return of Count Fersen did not escape public attention, though most likely he was the son of King Louis. A second daughter, Marie Sophie, was born the following year. In an attempt to rehab her reputation, the queen had this painting commissioned, portraying her truthfully as a loving mother. But baby Sophie died of tuberculosis at just 11 months old and was painted out of the cradle. When a friend tried to console the heartbroken queen that, owing to Sophie's young age, she must not have grown overly attached to her, Marie answered, "Don't forget that she would have been my friend." Her eldest son Louis the Dauphin was also ill from tuberculosis, and Marie became increasingly concerned for him. Meanwhile, she and the king exiled the parlement and called the Estates General, the elected legislature of the country, which had not been convened since 1614. She accepted the doubling of the third estate, which represented the common people, but stood with the second estate, the aristocracy, and the first estate, the clergy, in resisting badly needed reforms. On June fourth, seventeen eighty-nine, the seven-year-old Dauphin died, and his parents were distraught. On June twentieth, the third estate, fed up with the resistance of the other estates, took the tennis court oath and declared themselves a national assembly. Revolution was in the air. At the Queen's urging, Jacques Necker, finance minister and a leader of the revolutionary movement, was dismissed, and Swiss troops were called in to crush the rebels. At the news, Paris was besieged by riots that culminated in the storming of the Bastille prison on July 14th. They released the crown's political prisoners and seized the weapons and ammunition stockpiled there in preparation for battle against the crown and the aristocracy. Fearing for their lives, many courtiers fled, but Marie remained by the king's side at Versailles. The Marquis de Lafayette, with the help of Thomas Jefferson, drafted the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. On October 5th, bread shortages in Paris compelled a mob of women to march to Versailles. They were soon joined by 10,000 citizens, many of whom were armed. The queen was the target of their fury, and two guards were killed as the mob pushed into the palace and fought their way to the queen's bedroom, tearing it apart. But Marie wasn't there; she was cowering with the rest of her family in the king's chambers. The Marquis de Lafayette arrived with his troops to restore order, but the crowd forced the royal family to come back with them to Paris. The mob that escorted them carried the heads of their slain guards on pikes. Marie and her family were forced to move into the Tuileries Palace, where they lived under house arrest. For the next four years, the queen and her family lived in limbo. Marie continued to politic in an attempt to win advantage, but was primarily concerned with her two living children during this difficult time. Many revolutionaries wanted to keep the monarchy, but under the authority of a constitution. The royal family attended a ceremony celebrating the one-year anniversary of the storming of the Bastille. 
There, the king was forced to pledge to uphold the Constitution and received cheers of God save the king from the crowd. Though some of the king's powers were restored, the family was still kept prisoner and they decided that they should try to escape. With the help of Count Fersen, the royal family and several attendants attempted to flee in a carriage, overladen with luggage including a full silver dinner service and a wine chest. Burdened down by the weight, the carriage made a slow progress through the French countryside. Less than 24 hours after leaving Paris, a peasant recognized the king from his image on a coin. He rallied a crowd to stop the carriage, seize the family, and drag them into a house where they were held captive. That night, Marie's hair turned completely white. Revolutionaries returned the family to Paris, where crowds jeered and insulted them as never before. The attempted escape had obliterated what little remaining support they had as it was clear that they had no intention of supporting the Constitution and the rights of the people. The family were now guarded closely day and night, and the Queen's health began to deteriorate under the strain. Marie wrote to her family in Vienna, begging for help and offering up French military secrets in exchange. Her nephew, Francis II, now emperor, was eager to go to war with France. When France lost several battles to Austria based on Marie's leaked information, she was seen as an enemy of France. Meanwhile, King Louis, who still had veto power over the National Assembly, vetoed several of their measures, hindering the work of the new government. In 1792, a furious mob broke into the Tuileries Palace. They forced the king to wear a red cap to show his loyalty to the Republic and threatened Marie's life. Desperate, the queen urged her foreign supporters to invade France, and they issued a manifesto that threatened to destroy Paris if anything happened to the royal family. In response, another armed mob attacked the palace, massacred the family's Swiss guards, and took the royal family to the Tower of the Temple, where they were held captive under much harsher conditions. Their attendants were taken away and interrogated. The queen's friend, Marie-Louise de Lombard, was savagely murdered, and her head was paraded through the streets. The mob called out to the queen to kiss the lips of her dead friend. Marie fainted at the sight. On September 21, 1792, the end of the monarchy was officially declared. King Louis, now known as Louis Capet, was separated from his family, tried, found guilty of treason against France, and beheaded by guillotine on January 15, 1793. He was 38 years old. Marie, shocked and devastated, lived in terror with her children for the next several months. They were tormented and insulted by their jailers, though Marie was able to bribe a few guards to take letters to her outside supporters in increasingly desperate pleas for help. Revolutionaries hatched a plot to retrain the eight-year-old Louis Charles into a king who would support the revolution. Louis Charles was taken away from his mother, and Marie physically fought the guards who came to claim him. She spent hours trying to catch a glimpse of her son, who, within weeks and under abuse, was turned against his mother and made to accuse her of horrible deeds. Marie was moved to an isolated cell, and in October was tried by the Revolutionary Tribunal. The outcome of her trial having already been decided, her lawyers were given less than a day to prepare her defense. Her many crimes, real and imagined, were paraded before her, including the outlandish accusation of incest with her son. This last allegation drew an emotional response from Marie who appealed to all mothers present that no mother could commit such an act. She elicited some sympathy from the crowd, but was nonetheless found guilty of depletion of the treasury, conspiracy against the security of the state, and high treason. She wore a plain white dress. Her prematurely white hair was shorn, her hands bound painfully behind her back, and she was put on a rope leash. She was driven through Paris in an open cart and kept her composure as the crowds hurled jeers and insults at their former queen. As she mounted the scaffold, she accidentally stepped on the shoe of the executioner. 
Her last words were, pardon me, sir, I did not do it on purpose. The once glamorous Queen of France was beheaded by guillotine at 1215 on October 16, 1793. She was 37 years old. Marie Toussaint made this death mask of Marie Antoinette. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, comment your thoughts, and check out my other royal history videos. If you really want to help, please consider supporting me on Patreon. A link is in the description. Thank you for watching.